um, I could read something that's more sort of environmental or climate themed, since that's a big part of the story. Or I could read something puro sananto. So uh, I'll take your uh, your suggestions now. You can just type type in the chat. Don't hesitate. Just if you're not used to doing Zooms, folks, there's a chat. <laughs> box on the bottom all you gotta do is press on it and then type in the empty oh good this is what i was hoping for puro sananto puro sananto puro sananto okay okay you got a majority of the vote there hold on just a second okay whenever my phone rings it plays on my computer as well so i'm i apologize <laughs> for that okay so i'm going to read a chapter called May Day, in which Sandra Cisneros makes an appearance as herself. And this is a true story. Okay, here's part one of the greatest May Day story in the world, originally posted to Facebook. It took place when Sandra Cisneros was in town visiting her old stomping grounds after leaving Texas for San Miguel de Allende. She's not really from San Antonio, but y'all claim her anyway, probably because all of that pedo she had with the King William Association over the audacity of the Purple House. Or was it pink? Her wicked, wicked ways and all. That was the first Chicana lit book you found and checked out from the school library. Or shit, maybe that was actually Lucha Corpi. But in any case, making you think maybe, as you wrote poems in gym class, all slouched up against the bleachers, maybe you too. Even though everybody thought you were a white girl, Sandra, on the back cover in the backless black dress, looking at you over her shoulder, with short hair and finger waves like a flapper and big silver earrings. Short hair like you, yeah. Because when Mexicans thought you were Anglo and Anglos thought you were, I don't know what, what you ended up was strange and short haired. So there's that. And then one time, long ago, before La Sandra left Texas, when Hector was working at the Thai Tea in Austin, he actually waited on her when she strolled into the restaurant one day. Her short hair had grown out into an exclamation of waves like this, and she laughed a lot as she dined with her friend. That's what Hector said. And then you also saw her speak at the anti-war matcha, also in Austin. She read prose poetry above the heads of the marchers gathered there, connecting the dots between the brown faces of gente aquí and gente allá in the Middle East, standing in a gazebo, not unlike the one where the speakers at this marcha will also speak. But it's not like you would know we're in a crowd, know what I mean? Anyway, on this particular May Day, on the first day of May, el primero de mayo, you've arrived with your nena to the Plaza de Secate for the pre-march rally, the very plaza where Emma Tanayuka rabble-roused the pecan shellers, that's why y'all call it La Plaza de Secate instead of Milan Park, and why all the marchas in San Antonio either start or end there and you're lounging in the zacate in the shade. Nena snoozing in her stroller and you kind of laying on your side propped up on one elbow, armpits sweaty and stinky. By the time it hits May Day, the last little bit of spring cool in the air has been wrung out and you have to square off with the reality of heat. You just gotta be matter of fact about it. Lean into it, it's easier than trying to get away. So then this woman in a flowy shirt dress thing and leggings and chanclas approaches to talk to another woman standing nearby, trailing a little dog on a leash wearing a homemade shirt that says, legality is a colonialist fiction. Ha, that's pretty clever and insightful little dog. Makes you think. No illegal immigration without a prior construction of legality. Like how Foucault talked about how there was no homosexuality until there was something called heterosexuality. No concept of visible deviance until there's an unseen norm to construct one. And the flyers talk about how May 1st is about workers and how immigrants are workers criminalized for seeking work across borders despite the border hopping liberties of capital. And how immigrants are not really immigrants at all. They are indigenous first with rights to itinerancy like the birds of the air or the fish in the sea. Imagine telling a bird it can't fly where it flies. Indigenous first and workers second. That's what the flyers and signs say. All of the organizations are pushing for the same glorious upswell as those big immigration marchas some years back, but 
those moments can't be planned or manufactured or predicted, no matter how much funding there is. They just happen, even when there's no money, energy swirling around an invisible fulcrum, and no one really knows why. So this year, the march is small, mostly the same folks who come to all the marchas. And you're looking around at all the people you know, and some you don't know too, and not really paying attention when, all of a sudden, the woman with the dog begins apologizing to you effusively, clearly mortified. You look over to where she's gesturing and see that her dog has just peed on the wheel of Nena's stroller and shoe. Oh, I'm so sorry, oh my God, says the dog woman, crouching to blot at the stroller with wads of Kleenex offered by the second woman. Oh, it's fine, it's just a little pee. Is he a puppy? No, just maleducada. Well, his little shirt is very smart. Hold on, there's my toddler. He's gonna to say hi bye. Hey, boo boos. After you share a final laugh, the two women walk off together. Bye bye. Hey, bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. After you share a final laugh, the two women walk off together, and you more or less forget about the incident until you notice later that the woman with the dog is in the gazebo speaking. She's the keynote speaker, actually, except wasn't someone able to get Sandra Cisneros as the keynote? Which means it was Sandra Cisneros' dog who peed on Nena's little shoe. Part two of the story is the same old stuff that always happens at all of the, at all of the marchas. There are some problems with the sound, then there are some speeches and spoken word, Someone must have connections because not only is La Sandra there, they've also been able to book Mayor Mijo to come and make a statement. Since this marcha takes place right after some dumb fuck in the Texas ledge introduces another one of those check your bills papers. So the mayor is there to say how bad it would be for business in Texas and for tourism in San Antonio if they were to pass something like that here. And everybody kind of stands around confused about whether to clap or not, kind of half clapping, half whispering to each other about what a vendido he is. After speeches, they line up and there is some tussling for position before the chant kicker off or kicks off the chants. El Centro has brought a banner that reads Trabajadores Unidos and La Alianza has one that reads Unida a Través de Fronteras. Might as well play tug of war of the same banner. It saves some canvas and paint at least. Oh, it is so like that and everyone knows it. Not saying for a second either that we shouldn't do these things. Not saying the stakes aren't high. It's because they are so high that we should laugh at this element of ritual or theater or carnival, this sacred ridiculousness. That's all. And because it's like, can there be some other t-shirt motif, some, some other motivating motive besides a woman in pain yelling while making a fist? Damn. The part three of the story is something new. As the people take to the streets, you spot the man from the vault standing on the curb taking phone photos astride his clunky orange cruiser, green bandana wrapped around his forehead like a sweatband, holding back his hair. You pretend not to notice as you pass pushing Nena. As you pass, you turn your face away from the camera, from where he stands in cutoffs and sandals. And it's already hot, but a wave of heat consumes your face as you see yourself seen, as if from outside, as you mumble chants and you think, where on earth did that come from, that heat? Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marisol. Um, I think maybe one of the hardest things about uh, deciding what to read in the is that there are so many levels to this book. I mean, I was, when, when I read it, I was struck by so many different aspects and I wasn't sure which one I liked more. And I think um, when everybody answered Puro San Antonio, that kind of vibe with what I was thinking because there's a delightful recognition in here of things good and bad. There's a recognition of things that are regional and also universal. 
I think the regional really draws us because we've had this overflow of books set in New York and books set in Southern California. And it's been really rare to find the heart of some, the San Antonio experience um, documented in literature and you do it so well. But that's only one of the things that I was struck by in, in this book. Um, I think knowing a place very well um, helps um, the prescience of the author. And I wanted to ask you what it was like to write about such strange concepts as uh, uh, a polar vortex falling over onto San Antonio at the same time that there are these rolling blackouts of electricity that hit some neighborhoods and not others. And then after the book was written to see those things coming at you from the news. I mean, did you feel kind of like you had a crystal ball someplace or people were gonna accuse you of being a witch or something? I mean, it just, uh, it, was, it was a stunning, well, I, stunning combination there. Yeah, it was pretty weird. I mean, it was weird for me to live through too. And actually before the vortex happened a couple of weeks, I had seen, somebody had forwarded me an article about an Australian company that was coming to Hondo. So a little town Southwest, just Southwest of, of San Antonio um, to uh, process rare earth minerals. And so like that was weird. So it was sort of like that happened and then the vortex happened and that, that was, I mean, yeah, I was as weirded out as anyone else. Um, but I do think I mean, so much of the book is based on like stuff that was already happening, had already been happening for a while. Uh, like Greg had a really kind of like interesting twist on that question about the vortex and stuff um, or about like, you know, things in the book seeming to, seeming to come to life, you know, after they were written about. Like he was asking, and Greg is, Greg is my partner um, and we do, we're, for those who don't know, um, we do deceleration together as co-editors. And his question was like, what does it say about sort of cultural amnesia that we would read this book and see it as predicting something to come rather than documenting things that have already been happening for a really long time, right, which was right. kind of what the book was doing. Yeah, um, because yeah. that vortex event in the book um, was based on a similar one that had happened in 2011. And I had to, and when I was thinking about like the climate change uh, uh, subplot, you know, I, I sat down, I thought like really deliberately, well, okay, if climate change got really bad here, if when climate change gets really bad here, what is that gonna look like? And, and actually the vortex was like much more of a minor part than the heat in the book. The mm -hmm. heat is sort of like, uh, I almost felt like I was writing it as a character, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, all the ways that we live with that heat um, and what you it know, means. The, the, the artist always is uh, the prophet, the artists in general are the prophets of society, not but prophet in the Old Testament sense of the word, which is they see the present. It's not so much you have to predict the future, you just have to see what's going on right now to know that there's a car coming down the road at a very high speed straight at us. And it makes you look like a prophet. Um, but the prophet, you know, the definition of the prophet needs to get away from the, you know, magic of some unusual sense and actually tie into the ability to, to see clearly what's happening in society at this point. Um, I think also in the book, um, there's so many tensions evident between fiction and nonfiction. Um, there's a lot of nonfiction in here, the, you know, in, in addition to the appearances by, by real public figures that, that we recognize. Um, and yet you call this a novel. Um, 
other options would have been to call it a creative nonfiction or an experimental memoir. Um, what do you think it means to call something fiction? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. And I, I um, like to some extent the, the question of like, well, what is real and what is not real in the book, like even exceeds like my own <laughs> ability to uh, kind of put a finger on it. But um, because I uh, just because uh, like that line con is constantly blurred, like I can point to things that are um, that are very like real that were based on just like, you know, straight up things that happened, but then they also slide in, they, they slide into the creative or they slide into the fictional as well. For example, like, um, you know, um, you know, the love story in the book is pretty much, is, is pretty straightforwardly autobiographical, but it's told in a certain way. I wanted, I, I had, I, you know, part of what I was doing was was trying to isolate a particular problem or dynamic within desire or within the way that I had sort of always experienced desire as like very overwhelming and destabilizing. So even while the book was like based on that real thing, I was, I had to write a story. I had to sort of like isolate it in these ways that weren't necessarily like strictly uh, non-fictional so that I could I could distill that problem in order to like understand it or, or, or think through it or, or write through it. Um, or, you know, the city politics stuff, like, you know, obviously uh, a lot of that is based on real stuff that, that has happened, but it's also, you know, I, I didn't want to write about one, I didn't want to write a scholarly book. I didn't want to write a history of a particular struggle. I could have done that. But I wanted to tell a story about like the, the anatomy of like all of those fights, right? That we're all, that we've been involved in for decades, whether it's, you know, about water, whether it's about development or about um, displacement. Um, there's an anatomy that there's a logic and I wanted to get at that. And the only way that I could do that was to, to mash them up all together, like in a fictional way, right? To make up a story about a near future or an alternate present where a mining company comes to San Antonio and discovers this huge deposit of rare earth minerals that the earth that the that the economy is going to need right if we're going to transition to fossil fuels really fast and that hasn't happened but um, but it certainly is based on like a lot of real struggles and a lot of real like city internal city politics stuff that will be really familiar to people um, but I think um, you know, I think, I think what's fictional about it is, is kind of like, the way that the real gets put together into one story, right? Um, and, and I wanted to insist on that, I think. I wanted to, to say like, no, this is a novel and this is fiction because I think that also makes people make, pay more attention to, um, to the way it's written. Um, and like, I wanted to, people to understand that even though the book is at times doing these really non-fiction-y things, these really like kind of wonky things in some ways, um, that I wanted people to engage with it as art, primarily like as creative writing. Yeah, yeah. I love that it's not a textbook, that it's a personal story because when it comes down to it, all of the things that happen in our environment um, are not just, you know, abstract concepts in the textbook. They have a personal impact on individuals. And you establish that from the very beginning of the book. Um, this book is very much uh, about San Antonio history and politics. What is it that you want readers to understand about San Antonio from this book? I mean, those of us who live there go, yeah, yeah, that's the way it is. But um, even people who are familiar with the city may, um, may be trying to understand this or other cities, other communities. What is it that you want them to understand about the context of a city in the middle of politics, change, reality, and an impact on human beings? Mm -hmm. 
I think above all, I wanted, I want people to understand um, that San Antonio is a colonial city uh, in many ways still, you know, even like it has this 500 year plus history and those that still resonates today into the the contemporary environmental and other kinds of politics here that we see play out like in city hall around development around the relationship to land um, and water uh, around the relationships to each other um, i think we can't really do anything about environmental stuff until we have that understanding that historical understanding that sense of deep historical context which leads us to have to a lot of us to have to um, also like recognize that we are descendants of the original inhabitants of this land whether you know this specific region or you know farther south um, when i was um I started writing this book when I was living in Kansas um, and teaching at KU um, and feeling extremely displaced and feeling in a, like this intense longing for San Antonio. And so that, that was like one of the origins of the book. But when, when I was living there in Kansas, like one of the places that felt familiar to me or that felt like community to me. Um, <clears throat> I got involved with um, a struggle that was happening there, it had been happening actually for a couple decades at Haskell Indian Nations University, um, which is a multi-tribal university. Um, and they had been fighting the Kansas Department of Transportation for decades, like since the 80s or 90s, I wanna say, um, because they were one, they, Department of Transportation was wanting to widen a roadway that would cut through some wetlands that were on the campus of Haskell, which had a, a history. Uh, it was under tribal administration uh, now, uh, you know, contemporarily, but it had been a boarding school. And so when it was a boarding school, the wetlands were where um, kids would go out to meet family members. They would go out to speak their native languages. They would go to, to um, observe, uh, you know, traditional uh, ceremony, um, and they were and 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 they were buried there when they died under the boarding school system, and um, when and so I got involved in the fight to against the Kansas Department of Transportation to preserve the wetlands there, and and there was something about like. Like I had never uh, organized, uh, I had organized around water, I had organized around environmental justice here, but there was something about like, specifically doing like native led, you know, supporting native led organizing that like it opened my eyes to what happens when people understand themselves as being, um, as their identities as being rooted in the land. Um, and what it opened my eyes to was, was the realization that there is something that colonialism cannot destroy when you have that, when you have the understanding of your identity, like the Kansas Department of Transportation could come and they did, like they did, they came in and they expanded that roadway ultimately, but they couldn't, they like there's something about that relationship to the land that just it's it cannot be destroyed and so when i came back to san antonio i thought man like on the one hand i thought man like what if we had that sense of ourselves as being tied to the land like that i mean a lot of what colonialism here did was like it, make that invisible to us right or take that away you know identify with the colonizer rather than our indigenous ancestors. Um, but then on the other hand, it made me realize, well, we kind of already do like fight for the land here in that way. You know, we kind of already do embody that. Um, and so part of what, um, you know, part of what the book I think was trying to say about San Antonio is like, 
Um, it was trying to honor that work that people have already been doing that comes out of that sense of mm -hmm. being tied coming mm -hmm. out of the mm -hmm. land. Um, and, 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 and to have people understand of like what is possible when, when we understand that um, like our efforts to protect the land can't be defeated or destroyed by landmen or developers or any of their, you know, neo-colonial administrators, like that that's, that is a source of strength and power that I, you know, that is, that is rooted here. That I, I think see. you've done a lot of good work towards that goal of helping people reclaim an identity, um, it, it, a cultural identity, a cultural tie to this place in the book. Um, because we have been maybe more so than many other communities. Um, we've had our, our identity legally dictated. I mean, if it wasn't enough to have the, the Spanish doing catechism uh, to move people away from the, from the indigenous languages and cultures into, into Spanish, and then having um, the, the later uh, English speakers uh, uh, outlaw the speaking of Spanish in schools. Uh, we also were actually legally declared in 1837 by the Republic of Texas. Um, all Indians of the uh, west of the Guadalupe River were from henceforth to be considered a part of the Mexican people. So it simplified discrimination because at that point, Mexicans were the enemy, the conquered population. So, okay, we'll just dump all the Indians over there. So it kind of stripped identity away. But I love the way that you work that, um, the, that reclaiming into the book at a subtle level without having to, to you know, uh, do it in a, in a stated or superficial way. It, it really penetrates. And it reminds me of when I first met you, because you were a full-time community organizer when we first met. Um, do, you, uh, do you feel that you have to navigate uh, a shift from activism to art when you start writing about it? Or do you feel there's some kind of dynamic tension that allows you to do both at the same time? Yeah. Um... Yeah, so when we met, yeah, I was working as an organizer at Esperanza. Um, but that was already like, okay, so before I was ever an organizer, before I was an academic before that, um, I was a poet as a teenager, as a young person. Um, that was the first political thing I did was to write poetry. Um, but I got discouraged uh, kind of at an early age. Um, and so I ended up going into academia um, and then I got dis disillusioned with that and I left that and I went to community, organ you know, I moved back home and I went to community organizing. Um, so at least in San Antonio, like people knew me as an activist, um, maybe as somebody who kind of tried to bring in academic stuff into, act into activism. Um, but then, so loose for me was like the coming back, like, of poetry, of fiction, mm -hmm. of like these earlier ways of, of being and doing that, that had been my first kind of like uh, way of doing things politically, right? And it didn't feel like a choice. It felt like it was like more like this involuntary, like, like I was supposed to be teaching. I was supposed to be like turning my dissertation into a book, but instead this like other thing was happening and I had to just go with it. Um, so I started writing it and then in fact that became like the sort of like what impelled me to leave academia um, and go into activism. And so, you know, I came back home, started working as an organizer. The novel kind of like is about a lot of, you know, is based on a lot of those experiences. Um, but in the process of doing that work, I realized um, that that I was too much of a writer to like organize, that it was really about time. Like if I had all the time in the world and I didn't have, you know, family, if I didn't have kids, well, I could keep organizing and also write, you know, like I wouldn't have to have like this tension or maybe I would, I don't know. 
but but with like t time the limit you know the constraints of time and like your own in health and everything like I had to make a choice like I could either um like it was it came down to like these very concrete decisions you know I could keep going to meetings or I could uh I could finish my book <laughs> and um you know as as a parent like that was that was the real that was just the realistic thing of it um and so so yeah in deciding to finish it in committing to that I realized I had to to make it public in a way that I hadn't done um for like a couple decades, you know, like with my fiction and poetry. Um, and for that, I actually, I credit Urban 15 and, and Mega Corazon um, for, I guess, showing me like the responsibility that a person has to like finish a work by making it public, right? Um, but, but, uh, but I think I, I mean, one of the, the biggest, the bigger tension in me that I, that I dealt with was just like, even just giving myself permission to make that shift. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of ways that um, social movements can kind of like give lip service to art. Um, but what they really think is like the urgent important thing is collective action, right? Going to meetings, going to, you know, going to city hall, speaking before mm -hmm. council, um, you know, sitting by yourself and, and writing something like, like I had to struggle against a certain idea of that as like selfish. Um, but um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I still struggle with it. Like, I want to jump into stuff. I want to like get involved in stuff. But I, yeah, yeah. the book was really fearless in in uh, it, it, writing about internal tensions and and contradictions within movements and within communities. Um, were you ever worried about airing dirty laundry, or did you see this as actually part of um a, a, a fuller activism i did worry about it um I, I guess i worried like in a couple of ways like uh on one level you know i'm i worried that like criticizing certain kinds of climate response by the city um would sort of play into the, well for example like you know, the, hold on, I want to make sure I get this part right. So I, I wrote it, to put some notes down. Um, yeah, like, I think the city's had a certain climate response where we think we can just replace one technology with another, right, without having to like make deeper changes economically or socially. And, and I was worried that in sort of trying to call that out in the book, I would sort of be carrying water for the other side, you know. Um, like if I if if I'm saying, oh y'all are just um, y'all are shifting to renewables, but don't you realize that renewables are going to cause just as many problems because it's based on intensive mining that's going to have to take place somewhere? Like you know, like I'm worried that that gives power to like people that don't want to see that transition at all right like I, so I worried about that um but then I think you know also in writing about like infighting the infighting within within organizations and across organizations um just so costly <laughs> yeah it is so it, costly to movements and to individuals is. and their survivability emotionally and psychologically yeah yeah and yet there's people that you know you hear in the community like you know some people will say like you should never fight in front of the powers that be right you should never like y'all might be infighting but never show that right never talk about that or never like put that on paper or never because then it shows them that you're you're divided right um but i don't um i don't know that i agree with that i think I think that, you know, for both. Uh, Go ahead. You get a more memorable uh, uh, portrayal 
when it's honest. And I think everyone senses that. And then the book becomes more meaningful to them. And then they're able to be affected by it. Yeah, it's it's like, it's not like this stuff, like these are open secrets, right? Like, mm -hmm. and I think it's better to be honest about open secret. It's better to just say, you know, that there's a problem, right? Because ultimately like, mm, otherwise it's a false unity and that undermines what everybody claims to be doing, right? Or claims to be yeah. what they want to be doing. So yeah. on a on a more personal note, both of the main characters and, and some of the minor characters as well are struggling with different experiences um, of, of mental illness or, or what I consider a more accurate description, a, a newer term, neurodivergence. Um, how does this become a central focus of the story? And can you talk about some of the choices you made and how you represented these experiences, which are uh, experiences that I think as a society, we're growing more and more aware of? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's central. It's definitely central in a couple of ways. The main one is because I myself identify as neurodivergent. Um, if you haven't heard the term before, what that basically means is just um, that my brain works differently uh, and has for as long as I can remember. Um, like it's a term that you hear, I think most frequently in relationship to like the autism spectrum, but, or ADHD. Um, and it's a kind of similar concept to like when the deaf community capitalizes D in deaf, right? Like to suggest that it's not a disorder, it's, it's a difference, right? Um, in my case, like the difference is just this core intensity that's always been there that sometimes manifests as like what we would call illness, um, anxiety, depression, mania. But in some cases, like, um, you know, that intensity is, 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 is an opening to the sacred or is an open, is, is, is very powerfully creative, like the source of creativity. Um, and so in the book, I mean, the book is in a lot of ways, like an attempt to understand what that experience is, what that intensity is. Um, you know, when I fell in love with the person who's, who's now my spouse, um, you know, I experienced something that like from one perspective was very clearly an episode of manic depression, <laughs> but at, at, which was like really disabling um, in that I became not able to function. Um, but from another perspective, like, you know, that whatever that experience of intensity was, it was also really profound. It was like spiritually profound. Mm -hmm. Like it cracked me open and, and it made my existing life course feel just untenable, but in ways that were truer to like what I wanted to be doing. Um, and then from another perspective, perspective you know I think that intensity like even though it's extreme it's still very ordinary like a lot of people go through that a lot of people have those experiences it's part of the spectrum of like ordinary human experience um it's a heightened sensitivity and you know it's funny because if we talk about somebody who's got uh, a high intelligence so that's considered a good thing or or high energy that's considered a good thing you know high um, creativity and when we talk about high sensitivity emotional sensitivity people kind of uh, do not normalize it they try and and make it something um, uh, that is totally negative and and I love that you uh, were able to present it in ways that showed it, showed the benefit, um, the, the holiness and the creativity and the, um, the potential that could come from heightened mm -hmm. sensitivity. And I think that's a very, very positive uh, uh, concept to reveal. So yeah. this, this book becomes groundbreaking on a whole bunch of different fronts, uh, not just uh, for environmental concerns, not just for awareness of the need for activism, um, but also, um, you know, uh, the, the whole concept of neurodivergence um, and its impact on the individual. 
you know, and how an individual can be yes. such, such a significant part of a society in part because of the neurodivergence. Yeah, the other, the other thing I wanted to say about that too is like, I really uh, wanted in the book to write about those experiences without using any kind of diagnostic language because that was how I, how I myself, um, I didn't have that language until I was probably like in my late twenties or early thirties. I didn't know that people had conditions or whatnot, you know, that you could give those experiences a name. Like, and so I, I for both Lolly and Joel, um, and Joel is in some ways an extrapolation of, of my partner, but like, but in a lot of ways, he's also just, he's also based on my own experiences. Um, but for both of those characters, like, yeah, I wanted to try to narrate those experiences from the inside um, and, and to try to like, you know, they never, they never mention anxiety or they never mention depression or mania or psychosis, like, um, Because yeah, I think that's the way that a lot of people experience those states. They don't, um, and I think that that yeah, that that was important to me when I was like kind of deciding how to write about those things. You describe the book as a love story, um, but pretty much all the relationships in the book fail. Uh, was that? Uh, part was that on purpose was that something that just happened when you were writing or um was your intention to to show that uh contradiction maybe a a, a, a dynamic contradiction yeah i think i i guess like at a certain point when i was writing it i noticed that and then i was in the but it like resonated with me i was like oh yeah exactly of course like they all have to fail <laughs> like because the because the book is so much about like that problem of desire like like what is the nature of this like intense experience of longing whether it's for a place because that i mean it, as much as the book is a, about sort of unrequited longing for another person it's about this longing for place to understand place to be able to protect place um and uh and so, yeah, I think it's only appropriate that like, you know, you have all of these, <laughs> all these characters that are trying to be with other people that they can't be with. And even, you know, even like Joel and Luz, the dog, he, he, he wants to keep loose. He wants to keep loose, but she just won't be kept. You know, she's, yeah. she, Who, yeah. I mean, the whole book is named after Luz and she doesn't appear as consistently as some of the other characters, but who is Luz? What does she symbolize? Yeah, so Luz, um, I mean, I guess kind of most, um, obviously she's a kind of like coyote character, kind of trickster character. She's the most, definitely like the most um, speculative uh, kind of like part of the book, the most magical realist part of the book because, you know, we're sort of being asked to believe that this dog could have been spontaneously generated right in a lightning storm a climate change lightning storm in Brackenridge mm -hmm. Park right like poof there's this dog like being born um but and then she also you know she she's sort of like just the chaotic like she's the mystery of the forces that drive the universe that we that we are all like longing to understand and be able to systematize but can't quite right so she's the one that's like bringing Joel and Lolly together. She's the one that's leading Joel to, as a journalist, to sort of like, uh, you know, unravel the scandal that every, the city scandal that like everybody has been trying to figure out. You know, who's, a, who are these emails that are going back and forth between, you know, people in the company that's somebody in the company that's in bed with somebody in the city. Like, Luce is the one that guides Joel to sort of like that hidden knowledge. But she's also, um, I mean, the choice to have her be born at Brackenridge, I think, um, Brackenridge Park, that historically is where, you know, um, the city, uh, the city for many years would incinerate animals. 
um, you know, they would, uh, before they were a no-kill uh, mm -hmm. city, had that policy, um, all the strays would be rounded up and then they would be euthanized. Um, and, and then, you know, for a long time after that, people would still be dumping their animals in the park. So she's, she's also the stray. She's a stray animal. She's the unwanted of the city, right? Um, she's, she's what power excludes. She's beautifully symbolic. You know, uh, this book has so many layers, uh, so many threads that run through it, a lot of complexity. For those of you who don't know it, uh, um, it won uh, the uh, Best First Fiction Award from the Texas Institute of Letters. Uh, you know, it's anything but simple. And yet it has all the beauty of these, these very uh, simple, pure, in many way, way characters. Um, what was the most challenging thing about writing this book for you? It's certainly, I'm, I'm positive it was not an easy experience and I know it was years in the making. What, what was the hardest part of writing Loose at Midnight? I think it was just how big and like out of control it went. <laughs> what was coming up? Um, yeah, it was just, just getting it done. And part of that, again, was like, yeah, the size and the complexity of it. But, um, and then part of it was just everything else that I was doing at the same time, right? Like kind of when my knowledge was more submerged that, that what I really wanted to do was right. You know, when I was, when I was working as an organizer, or when I was working as a professor, um, and then also trying to write this thing on the side, right? Like, right. <laughs> once I kind of like, once it, once that knowledge was less submerged and more in my consciousness, like, so that I made it sort of intentional, oh, okay, this is a book, this is a novel, like, that's mm -hmm. why this thing is so big. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do something with it, I'm going to try to do something with it. Then, you know, I got a little easier. Um, but yeah, just, I, I guess that was the other thing that was challenging about it, too, is like, in writing the novel, I passed, I had to pass through like my original doubt in myself. Um, people didn't know me as a writer, like I'd always done it, but I had never really, that wasn't my public facing right, self. Right. And I had to claim it, like I had to tell people. Yeah. Marisol, we've got about two minutes before we invite our, our participants uh, to ask questions. But I know when you and I were tied into this earlier, you said you had a question you wanted to ask okay. of the audience. Yeah. Um, do, you need, do, you, do you remember what that question is you want me to tell you what we were talking about? Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in a book that has um, so much about the complexities and the contradictions and the dysfunctions in both love and politics and society in general. Is there space for hope in the story? That's, I think, the way you, you put it to me. Um, in the end, is the story hopeful about our ability to work together um, to respond to uh, the ecological crises or to form lasting connection with others, which is actually part of the ecological crises is also if, if we can't form uh, lasting connections with others, we can't form lasting connections with the planet either. It's like, no, we'll just hop on a spaceship and go to a different planet. Since we mess this one up, we'll just go do, you know, the similar job someplace else. Um, or do you see the end as more pessimistic? Uh, I guess this is what you were asking people. It does, does the book leave space for hope? in your hearts when you finish it, I think is what, is that, am yeah, I am, that correct? Yeah, I'm just curious to know what people think about the ending, if, you, if you've gotten to the ending, like, and whether you see it as, as hopeful or not. And I guess I ask, cause I'm not sure myself, um, but I always find it so interesting to hear, like, uh, I always find it really interesting and also really touching uh, when people respond to that question because it tells me it tells me more about the person about the reader than about the book. Um, but I always learn something interesting and new when I ask people that question. 
Right. So I'm just well, curious what y'all think. Yeah, I, I, w I think we could talk for a long while about this book. I was honored to see it um, early on in its development, but we really do want to hear from the rest of you. Um, and, and I think Blake and Alexandra are going to take over in the um, um, uh, unmuting the, the individuals with questions. So this is your chance to ask Marisol anything you want to ask about Luce at Midnight, about her process, about her symbolism, um, or just to give her a compliment on, on segments that you found especially moving. Um, so Blake, Alexandra, take it away. Well, thank you both. This is such a great conversation and um, about writing and everything else. I do believe everybody has the, uh, the ability to unmute themselves. So it, if you want to ask a question, just unmute yourself and uh, we can, we can kind of go from there. I don't see any, are there any questions in the chat? Moby Warren has a, uh, just came in has a, a, a response to that question. It's yeah. Moby, if you'll unmute yourself, you can jump in. Um, <laughs> I didn't really mean to have to come on and, and speak. I, I just thought you could read what I wrote in the chat, but I'll, I'll read it out loud. I guess at the end of the book, I felt that there was space given for hope but in the sense that the novel really allows us to dig into the difficult and contradictory territory of what it means to be human, what it means to be on the planet at this time. And I really believe that it's only when we profoundly accept who we actually are, where we actually are, what is actually going on, you know, that deep, and it's a, it's a, it's a process of grief, it's a process of this profound acceptance to look at things as they are, but that when you really do that, and to me, the novel plunges us into that, that out of that emerges a new kind of energy, that it releases energy to think and act in a new way. So that was sort of what the novel did for me. I'm going to mute myself now. Thank you, Moby. I love that. Yeah, I, I guess um, the way that I kind of think about it, um, but I'm, you know, if other people want to also share their 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 thoughts about it, I don't want to like take that take over that process. But you know, um, she doesn't get what she wants in the end, right? Like her life kind of continues on this path that's been set for her. Um, but but she's free from the illusion that it was a path that she had chosen. Um, and like desire, like desire is important, not because we get what we want necessarily, but because it cracks open, it, 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 it liberates us, it opens up things that are closed, right? You know, just like there's a, there's an intransitiveness about desire, like a for itselfness that points to our own agency politically and, and personally. Um, Norma Jean, did you want to expound on what you put in the chat or or even Carolyn um, to the question yeah. you posed? I don't know if I can add much more than what is there um, because it's been a while since I've read it. But my memory was feeling that there was a lot unresolved, but then there was just a sense that because so much had been pursued and there was such a, a, a passion to get to the bottom of things that I felt like that was what was going to, in the end, serve itself and, and present something worth pursuing. Thank you, Norman. And then Carolyn, too. I'm going to read. Oh, thank you. Carolyn, is it okay if I read your comment? Uh, sure. Okay. Or did you want to read it? Well, I, uh, I guess, as someone else has said, um, 
it's there to read in the chat as uh, kind of unfolded for me. Um, this is such a deep, rich, um, empowering uh, conversation and, and um, about process. And, um, oh, I'm, I'm just awestruck. <laughs> and um, thank you for sharing your gifts by the choices that you've made and um, the way you've, you've un made this real for the rest of us, as well as for anyone who reads it. Thank you, Carolyn. That's like, that's a, that's a blessing for me. Thank you to hear. Thank you. May I ask a question? For sure. Awesome. I think Alexandra has one too, but I'm, I'm gonna ask mine first, if you don't mind, Alexandra. Is that all right? Is that okay? Okay. Um, San Antonio, as you said, is also a character and I clearly, I mean, how could you not see San Antonio as a character? Um, and you make it at once beautiful and frightening where monstrous ideas about the environment and climate change commingle with the everyday lives of your characters. The balance you strike between these worlds is nearly pitch perfect, never teetering one way or another without suddenly snapping back. The question is, did you have to rein yourself in when you were writing one or the other, or did they grow out of each other in a kind of symbiosis? Like the beautiful and the monstrous? And the love story. Oh. Like you strike such a great balance between yeah. like the non-fictive and the fictive. Gotcha. And I was curious, like did one sort of take over or did um, you have to rein yourself in? Well, so it's an interesting question that makes me remember the way that it was, the way that I wrote it or the way that it wrote itself. Cause I wrote it out of order. Like I actually wrote it, I wrote the love story first, knowing uh, that it was gonna be part of a bigger story that was the political story, but it was the love story that like really felt super urgent to me. And that just came out like I, you know, I outlined the story I storyboarded and stuff like that. Um, but then I just wrote what I felt like writing. Um, I wrote whatever called me next, right? Um, I, I think that the, the book, I've heard people say uh, that they struggle with like, that it has a kind of like top heaviness to it. There's a lot of like the political story is sort of first. Like even though the love story was written first, the love story, you don't really get it until the second half of the book or, you know, towards the end, right? Um, and, and I is think- Is that true though? Don't you get the love story love? sort of throughout the whole, isn't it sort of peppered throughout the entire- It is. Yeah, you get little, you get little foreshadowing. Sorry, right? I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, 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 no. I just I'm finished good. reading it, so it's like really fresh. So yeah, uh, I do think it is. Yes, yeah, it's foreshadowed here and there, and you get, you know, you're sort of wondering who the relationship is between, like the, per, you know, the corporate person and the city person. Um, uh, that's the kind of runs parallel to like later than the love story between the two main characters, um, but when I, and I didn't intend to do it this way necessarily. I didn't intend for there to be a kind of like, first it's the political story and then it's the love right. story. But then when it did come out that way, I felt like it was appropriate um, because like I, because I think the story about desire and about love, about longing can only be understood in its political, in the political historical context in which it happened, right? And so, and, and vice versa, like you can't understand like the San Antonio politics story without the love story, like you need both, right? But if you had, if, but, but I felt like it was appropriate to make people work, <laughs> like for the love story, um, like before you can get there, you have to understand, you have to understand like where this happened and why and, and what the stakes were. Um, you have to understand like 
these historical political things, right? For to get to that like sweet universal um, story, right? Um, so it I didn't con like to I guess to go back to your question, like I didn't make conscious decisions, but about how to balance those two elements of it. But once it came out the way it wanted to come out, I looked at it and said, "Yeah, I'm cool with that." Does that answer? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the, it, it's so seamless and it reads like reportage, which is almost for me the greatest kind of writing. Because you're like, did she make this up or is this real? <laughs> It's to both. <laughs> it's well, it's like John Dos Passos, right? I mean, it really kind of reminded me. Have you read 1919? Mm -mm. Child, you've got to read 1919. I mean, your book is very reminiscent of this American trilogy. Have you guys read whatever? I'm sorry, I'm I'm being a literary geek, but um it's the American trilogy, and there's a lot of sort of mirroring that goes on in your book that he does also. So I mean it's just your book is just so, like Dr. Tafoya said, it's so layered, but you also do these things that set up, like you tease the love story and then you drop it for lots of pages, you know? And that's like a, that's a device, right? I mean, that's a way to keep the reader reading. So you like know, you're like spinning the story, but it has all of these tentacles, but you always sort of come back, I don't know, it's, and San Antonio is like the center. It's great. Well, I'm glad it worked because, yeah, when I was totally works. I was like, uh, I, was, I don't know if this is a hot mess, but I guess I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> but thank you. That makes me feel better. Not a hot mess. No, it's thank amazing. You. Thanks. I was just going to ask a question, but I think Carmen, you beautifully answered it earlier. I was the the time framing of the novel. I found really interesting, like this kind of like present morphing into near future and it has almost a slightly disorienting effect to it and then it's also very grounded but you answered that beautifully where you were like it's you know your answer was lovely Carmen where like if you really are present in the present you'll see what's coming everyone but um so if you wanted to comment on that at all a little bit more money so that would be lovely and I also just love the fact that you begin your novel with the word improbable <laughs> did you think a lot about, and I think your prologue's beautiful, but did you think a lot about that first sentence in the novel? I would just love to know, and that it just begins with improbable, that word. I, The poet and word nerd in me loves that. Yeah, I don't know. It just, I mean, that wasn't a, there was like, no, it just, that's just how it happened. I mean, it just wrote itself that way. I don't know. Um, but in terms of like the temporality of it at first, you know, it's interesting, it's, it's interesting because uh, at a different, like at a different point in the drafting of it, I was much more sure that I was gonna be writing a near future story. Mm -hmm. um, that would that be the word for it? Like just slightly in the future, in other words, like, uh 2025 or something like that 2030 mm -hmm. um but then um i had a friend um kamala platt uh helped me edit by the t basically by the time that i had a first or second draft and she was reading it as the editor um there was such just a major political shift that happened in 2015, 2016. Um, like it's very much, it's very much a book about sort of like um, the problems of like a uh, corporate Democrat kind of government, right? Um, or a certain like liberal government on the, on the, on the local level. And on, it's like, an, it's an Obama era novel. You know what I mean? Um, where you could, you could, conceivably imagine that very quickly the federal government, yes, it would be trying to rapidly transition off fossil fuels, creating these contradictions then around mining and extraction. 
And then the 2016 election happened and we were living in a very like radically different kind of world with very, very like much more constraint. Like it, it, that part of the book like kind of didn't. Um, and so, and Kamala was the one that pointed that out. And I realized, yeah, like that, that it was true. And, and now, you know, it shifted again, although maybe not, maybe this is just a temporary like reprieve in a longer like plunge <laughs> into autocracy, but- um, Marisol, but yeah, yeah. what you've just been speaking about uh, suggests to me something that Carmen picked up on quite a while ago, the prophetic nature of what you've been, what you've been about. The, the now, but into the near future. And, and um, as well as other things that where you really are about the sacred and the sacredness. And I, I thought you were digressing a bit earlier when you got into talking about your time in Kansas. Mm -hmm. I thought, no, 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 no. That's where you really were talking. You were also experiencing the, um, the sacred that is both uh, universal and particular. And you incorporated that into what you wrote and, and uh, focused in Luz as well. And, and that wonderful symbol. But I'm so, so glad that Carmen brings in how you are prophet in what you write. <laughs> And this is the nature, Marisol, of, of, a, of a truly great piece of literature is that it is prophetic, it is interpretive, and yet it's very personal, it's not propagandistic, um, and, and it makes me think of what happened um, with uh, your fellow Texan, uh, Lawrence Wright, when his book, The End of October, came out, I think... Um, it, the copyright date was like, was written like in 2018 and the copyright date was 2019. And the book came out maybe January of 2019. And then the uh, coronavirus hit the news in, you know, about February of 2019. Yeah. And, yeah. and I mean, 2020, I mean, we're switching over it, which it, it was not written about what was happening. It was written about something that could happen, that was obvious that it could happen, that was likely to happen. And he was just uh, alert enough to see those things, to write them. And then he had to watch what he'd written popping up in the news. <laughs> and of course it was uh, different in certain ways. Um, I think yours was actually more precise and more prophetic because it resembled more closely what actually did happen. Um, but this is the nature, I think, of great literature, is the ability of the author to observe and to capture what's going on around us all that we're not noticing. And the prophets yelling and screaming, look, look, open your eyes. Um, you know, I, In I, our I, midst. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope if that's true, that people um use the book uh as a manual for like how not to respond to climate change <laughs> <laughs> but not to do if you're a city government <laughs> or any kind of government i would like to um, can i just i'll ask the obvious question but what i mean i did post in the chat everyone if you're like oh my god i have to read more of Marty soul's writing what else she does have this one some two recent pieces that are, are part of a three-part series, Marisol, on the, um, it, you know, being obviously published in the online journal she co-edits, Deceleration. So I put those links in the chat. Um, and we'll, we look forward to the part three of that when it comes out as well, Marisol. But um, is there another writing project that you're like in the process of beginning and that you want to share a little bit about? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, so distilleration is kind of where I do more, more of my, not, like my straight forwardly nonfiction kind of activist um, community-based analysis 
work because uh, that stuff, you know, like I always want to write that way too. So that's kind of like where I can put it. <laughs> um, but in terms of like more like poetry and fiction, um, yeah, I have a couple. Uh, uh, the story that I'm like really longing to, it's, it's, I'm longing to write it, but it's also scaring me. Um, well, everything that I write is kind of like that. <laughs> but um, I want to write a, and folks that have come to other events have heard me talk about this maybe, or if you're on my email new, news list, news, newsletter, you've heard me talk about this. So I apologize for repeating myself, but I wanna write this um, speculative, uh, maybe short, longer short story or novella possibly. I'm hoping it's not a novel because that's too much, too long. I need it to be fast called Planet of the Bonobos. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's a sort of, it would be a reflection on, on the Trump years. Um, but uh, based on a text conversation I had with a friend from like, that I grew up with in elementary, you know, we went back to elementary school together uh, and we didn't have a personal relationship per se. We wouldn't talk about our lives, but like we would always be constantly texting each other during like the Trump administration about, about news. We'd only, talk, we'd only talked about politics or COVID. But I remember we, the origin of the story came from a particular exchange we had where he, um, he was like, I hope, I hope COVID, I hope COVID gives these guys erectile dysfunction. And I was like, I don't, I hope COVID disables their will to power. Like, I hope that it, you know, makes them amazing, beautiful, like, uh, empathetic, altruistic human beings, like that would be justice. And so like from there, I started like thinking about this a story um, uh, where that sort of like imagines that like this family dynasty continues until like 2050, like they're still in power, right? And they secede from the US. Um, they start importing bonobos the the sons start importing bonobos onto the golf courses. They've turned all the national parks into golf courses um, and they're big game hunters and um, they've killed off everything else. So they bring in these bonobos and then they start eating the bonobos. And of course, like, you know, then they get a virus that um, makes them altruistic like bonobos. <laughs> so, um, so that's one thing, but, but then I'm also um, like the next like big, big book that I want to write, which I think is still maybe like a few years away. Cause I have to, I have to do a lot of research and I have to, I have to learn some techniques that I like don't know, I feel like um, narratively, but I, I would like to write a historical work of fiction kind of based on my grandmother's story. Um, my grandma, my dad's side, um, who um, kind of took to her grave that she, her father, we, we, think from all sort of genealogical research we've been able to do after her death was a Jewish um, refugee from Russia at the time to Veracruz, Mexico. Um, and she kept that secret. Um, she did not want to talk about that. And, um, and she became Chicana, you know, she became Mexican American and that family became Jewish in San Antonio and they like never, they, there was no acknowledgement. Um, of that of the inter of the interconnectivity of those immigration histories. So there's a story there that I that I'd like to tell um, that has a lot to do with maybe just like um, the distances that can be in inside of families um, and sort of like the way people collaborate to not talk about the most important things. Um, but that's that's kind of like, if I could publish that in a decade, that I would feel good. <laughs> it's gonna take a while. I, I think it's gonna have to be sooner, Marisol, because I was already mentally writing these things down on my list of things I wanna read. I wanna read The Planet <laughs> of the Bonobos and I wanna read this historical novel of yours and, and I wanna do it before 10 years is up. So. <clears throat> All right. 
<laughs> I'll do it for you, Carmen. Well, well I thought, thank you all. Yeah, I, 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 go ahead, Alexandra. No, no, wrap up, Carmen. I would love you to, yeah, wrap up. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I, I'm just delighted. I, I, um, I came in with a lot of questions, but I think I'm leaving with even more uh, questions and answers and, and additional questions. And I feel very stimulated. And I'm especially uh, delighted by uh, the participants and, and their questions and their comments on the chat. Um, I you know want to thank everybody who had anything to do with, with this program and the whole concept of the Big Texas Read as well, and Jim and I Inc. for hosting us, but especially you, Marisol Cortez, for uh, being such a wonderful human being, uh, such a conscientious activist, and such an amazing writer. I think it's been a real honor to be able to join in this community discussion of uh, Lucid Midnight. Thank you for writing it, and thank everyone for being a part tonight of this program. Thank you. Thanks, Gemini. Thank you, Gemini Inc. And thank you, Blake. And where did he go? Where did he go? David, thank you so much. I'm just, it's a, yeah, this is like a dream come true for me. So it's a big honor. Thank and you. writing thank you. workshops, Dallas, who are our wonderful collaborators on the Big Texas Read. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy. We'll see you at the next Big Texas Read. Thank we you. love you all. Come back. We'll see you on February 3rd, Wednesday of every month, everyone. <laughs> yes. Thanks so much, Thanks. Marisol and Carmen. This Thanks, is great. Thanks, Marisol. Thanks, Thank Carmen. You. Thank, Thank you, you all. Y'all are awesome. Awesome, awesome, Thanks. awesome.